Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, uh, Dr. Antoinette Stanton. Dr. Stanton's a professor of psychology and psychology behavioral sciences here at UCLA. She's a senior scientist at the Cousins Center for Psychoneuroimmunology and member of the Center for Cancer Prevention and Control uh, Research in our Cancer Center. Her team uh, is embedded with us in clinic every day um, and uh, makes very important contributions for really mental well-being of our patients. Uh, and this is Dr. Uh, Stan uh, Stanton's expertise. I'm delighted to be here with you today, and I'm inspired. Um, I'm inspired because I see so many of you who either are yourselves living with pancreatic cancer or living with pancreatic cancer as someone who loves someone who is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. In fact, we ask, you know, who's living with pancreatic cancer early this morning? How many of you love someone diagnosed with pancreatic cancer? All the more impressive. That's what I want to talk with you about today. The, the experience of living with pancreatic cancer. Something, unfortunately, we don't know very much about. And that's why I'm so grateful to Aggie Hirschberg and to Dr. Go for supporting, I think it's the first research on living with the disease um, that the Hirschberg Foundation has supported. So I am just delighted by that. So what I want to talk a little bit about is the impact of the disease on the person and on the caregiver, what we do know so far, um, in physical, psychological, social, and spiritual dom domains, because we know that cancer affects the totality of life, not just one domain, and certainly not just the physical. I also want to talk a bit about contributors to well-being in people who live with the disease. Now, what we know about this is actually not from people living with pancreatic cancer. We know about this in people living with other cancers. And so that's part of the, what we're trying to do in research, understand what contributes to well-being in pancreatic patients here at UCLA and also uh, around the area. And then I'm going to talk about coping strategies for living with pa pancreatic cancer. So um, the first initiative that the Hirschberg Foundation funded, which will be published, I believe, next month. It's, out. it's out? Yeah. Oh my gosh. We have a new publication. Please go read it. Um, <laughs> we just did the proofs. Um, this, is, this is really a credit to my wonderful graduate students and collaborators. So Maggie Bauer, Emma Bright, James McDonald, Elizabeth Cleary, Dr. Hines and I were um, published in to yesterday um, a paper on what's called a systematic review of understanding quality of life in people with pancreatic cancer and their caregivers. Now, we started, and I have to give credit to my team who are all over here, um, started looking at, this is an attempt to find every single study of this topic. And so they started with 7,000 articles from the research literature. We ended up with 36. There are 36 scientific articles, either quantitative studies, so really trying to measure how people are doing with living with pancreatic cancer, or what are called qualitative studies, which is trying to understand the lived experience. And there are only seven articles that did include caregivers, and then there are only 36 articles all told. Now that compares to thousands of articles on the experience of living with breast cancer. Um, and so certainly it's not that breast cancer is not worthy of study, it's that pancreatic cancer now is coming to the table as something very important to understand the lived experience and then to translate those findings, and this is why publication is important to me, I think, translate our findings into effective ways to help, just as Dr. Donahue said. Um, 
We, I will tell you a little bit about the study we're launching, also um, funded by Hirschberg Foundation, on, it's called the PACES study, and I'll tell you a, bit, a little bit about that. But what we're going to try to do is add to those 36 studies by understanding the experience of patients and caregivers and trying to figure out what helps and hinders them as they experience the disease. So in this, some of, the some of the findings I'm going to review today are from this systematic review that's published in, Pancre in Pancreas, which is the um, journal that Dr. Go edits. Um, one of the things that was very clear is that there are physical symptoms, and you know this as well as anybody knows this, there are physical symptoms that affect people's lives when they deal with pancreatic cancer and its treatment. The most common ones appear to be pain. The studies suggest that 30% of more or 30% or more of people dealing with pancreatic cancer experience pain. And of course that depends on where they are in the disease, where they are in treatment, etc. But 30% or more Fatigue and disrupted sleep is another very common experience. And again, 30% or more seem to experience significant fatigue and disrupted sleep, of course, depending on who they are, the treatment, where they are in the process. Many of you know digestive problems, poor appetite, weight loss. Um, these are both, as Dr. Um, Tempura said, from the disease itself, the biology of the disease actually triggers weight loss, for example, and of course can contribute to digestive problems. Treatment also contributes, obviously, to physical symptoms, diarrhea, more weight loss, digestive problems. Oh, then there, I, I forgot that I was gonna say that, there are treatment-related problems specifically, including it depends on the treatment you're on, but you can, can have neuropathy, which is that either loss of sensation, sometimes pain in your hands and feet, particularly your legs. Sometimes it interferes with fine motor. Sometimes it interferes with walking. And so neuropathy can be a particular problem. Diarrhea can be a particular problem. And what we know and what you all know is these symptoms themselves can cause life disruption and distress. Now, let's talk a little bit more about both the physical experience and the psychological experience. Let me orient you to this, to this chart. Um, these are experiences, and these, these are people with pancreatic cancer and their caregivers. The red bar are caregivers. The purple, we'll call it, uh, bar are patients themselves. And these are the kinds of reports that patients and caregivers do report. The um, tiredness and worry seem to be the very most commonly reported problems. But also sadness, fear, anxiety, insomnia goes along with fatigue, hand in hand, obviously. Nervousness goes along with worry. Depression goes along with sadness and hopelessness sometimes. Now, one thing to note here, two things to note. What you see is that most patients don't report feeling these symptoms very often. So there are a significant portion who do, and we need to pay attention to that, but most people actually live well, even in the midst of a very serious disease. The other thing I'm sure you notice is that caregivers reported more problems than patients did. This tells us a couple of things, and one caveat I want you to know is that in this particular study, primarily the patients were men and the caregivers were women. What we know is that from many, many studies outside pancreatic cancer is that when you're doing caregiving, um, that women are particularly likely to report distress. That's also true actually in the general population women are more likely to report distress than men are, whether that, me that means that men 
have it and just aren't reporting it or don't have as much, we could talk about that later. But you see what the other point in this slide is that caregivers live with pancreatic cancer too. I want to mention depression specifically for just a moment um, because I'm, I would guess that there are some people in this audience who have experienced depression, either as a patient or a caregiver, and if you haven't, you might be helping someone who's experiencing or know someone who's experiencing depression. This actually is a big study of over 8,000 people who um, started to participate, who were, were had no sign of depression when they started to participate in this study. They were 51 to 61 years old. And then they followed, the researchers followed this group over many years, every couple of years, to understand then when people got diagnosed, for example, with cancer or cardiovascular disease, what happened. And these are the uh, proportion of people who have significant depressive symptoms. What you see here, I think, is two things. One is that people with cancer who were diagnosed with cancer, who did not have depression before, were more likely to have depression in that two years following their diagnosis. The other major disease is chronic lung disease that seem to prompt depressive experiences, and that's larger, a larger proportion than the general population. So people are at risk for depression when they get diagnosed with cancer. What we know that's special about pancreatic cancer, and I mention this because I want to make something clear about it, that is that depression in pancreatic cancer has probably been the most investigated quality of life aspect of pancreatic cancer. There are several studies now that suggest that depression or feeling sad, lack of interest in activities, other kinds of symptoms of depression, sometimes begin before the pancreatic cancer is diagnosed. That's interesting, isn't it? What I'm here to tell you, to emphasize, is that it is not that depression causes pancreatic cancer. It is much more likely that the kind of biological process that happens specifically in pancreatic cancer and some other diseases, Dr. Um, Tempura mentioned it in terms of the in inflammation and cytokines, that's very important with diabetes, it's very important with depression, with many other illnesses. It's quite likely that the biological processes that are happening in the disease affect depressive symptoms. That's not set to say that diagnosis is not extremely um, difficult for many people. This is not um, a study of people with depression. This is a an R01 funded by the National Cancer Institute that we just completed with 460 women with breast cancer in that first 16 months after diagnosis. And what you see, and this is depressive symptoms on this slide, on this side. What you see here is that in that first couple of months after diagnosis, depressive symptoms actually are relatively high. That's not clinically diagnosed depression, but they're still elevated. And people recover, women recover, across the course of that first 16 months. Now, that finding masks something very important. And what it masks is this. What this shows is what people really experienced, and it's not that everyone has elevated depressive symptoms and then they come down slightly. It's that there are different groups of people who experience depressive symptoms and who don't. So what you see here, this is the same slide, and that's, you see the, the big group. What you see here is that actually there were a group of women who started high in depressive symptoms and basically remained high, improved somewhat. There are 43% of women who actually never experienced depressive symptoms, and even they got a little bit better. Then there's also this group that's about 20% who start high, very disruptive in terms of depressive symptoms at the beginning, and then recover beautifully. We really need to know in our research 
what keeps people high on depressive symptoms and how to help people recover. We also need to know how to prevent depression. This is beautiful, right? <laughs> this is New Zealand. <clears throat> but, the, but the major point of this is that most people who live with pancreatic cancer, it appears, aren't always distressed. They're not always depressed. In fact, most aren't. Instead, people experience what we call islands of disruption. So islands of disruption are likely to happen at diagnosis, particularly during treatment, and then also post-treatment, some, for some people, certainly recurrence is a challenging experience. Concerns also vary widely across people. So some people, when they lose their hair, it's a big deal. It affects their identity. Other people, one of, I'm a, also a licensed clinical psychologist and I used to do cancer support groups, conduct cancer support groups. And one, one guy came in one day and he had a t-shirt that said hair by chemo. <laughs> he wasn't really all that upset about it, right? But some people are. Okay, there are also, of course, social impacts and spiritual impacts. So clearly symptoms can interfere with social relationships. If you are homebound for a bit because you really are experiencing a lot of diarrhea, you probably don't want to see people and you want, don't want to go out of your house. And so social impacts can impact, symptoms can impact social relationship. Work and finances obviously are affected by, for many people. And many people really begin to think about, if they haven't already, think about what gives them meaning in life and how to maintain hope. So there are many of you living with someone or living with pancreatic cancer. In all this ratty stuff about dealing with cancer, do you think about, is there anything positive in your experience? I see some nods. Would anybody be willing to say something positive in their experience? What have you found? Yeah. I find these last two years, my health has really gone down and I don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. um, as far as nutritionists that know about the Whipple thing, mm -hmm. um, I have, I take Bentil and a couple of things for nausea because it's like, as soon as I put something in my mouth, I get nauseated. Yes. And so um, basically my most important thing that I'm looking to learn is how to make myself better. Uh, my protein was so low, my hair was falling out. I never knew such a thing, you know, existed and t you know, till uh, it took two years. So you're working to yeah. find information, but, yeah. make yourself better. You have found something that helps you gain weight mm -hmm. and that's really important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another Per, yeah. I always had really long, thin red hair that I struggled with my whole life to make look stylish. Uh -huh. As soon as it fell out and I had it cut within like a quarter of an inch, everyone in my whole life told me how fabulous it looked. <laughs> and I love it and I intend to keep it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So you're beginning to capture some of the ways to cope and some of the things that people say are positive aspects of their experience. This is a quote, not from somebody with pancreatic cancer, but from someone, someone else participating in my research. I have people write about their experience. And she talks about the goodness of her family and friends. My guess is some of you have experienced that. I make more time for my friends and family. I begin to live according to my priorities, right? I do things more for myself and I don't feel guilty about it. That's something new sometimes in people's lives. When I think of the future, I realize that it may not be as long as I had thought, but having cancer makes me appreciate this moment. I see some nods. To sum that up, people talk about enhanced relationships, deepened appreciation for life, focused priorities, greater spirituality and meaning in life, increased personal strength, and attention to healthy behaviors. So those are the kinds of things that people find to help them through what can be a difficult experience. 
But I, want to, I have to say something. Especially in the United States, we're sometimes expected to be positive and strong all the time. You know, some people have bad hours, bad days, bad months with pancreatic cancer. And so I hope that you don't take this to mean that you should always be positive and strong. So caregivers, as we saw in the prior slide, also have an important role to play and themselves are affected, of course, with living with the disease, providing support on treatment days and beyond, talking with the doctor, asking questions. Sometimes it's not the person diagnosed, it's their caregiver. Who is, a, who is assigned to be the one to ask questions, to get information. Arranging and attending medical appointments, helping with managing diet is often in pancreatic cancer very important. Managing the household, updating family members and friends. So a lot falls to the caregiver to do. So. Caregivers experience psychological and physical consequences. You also saw, you saw fatigue up there as an important caregiver experience. Um, and some conceal their emotions to help make it better for the patient. In fancy psychology language, that's called protective buffering. And it's well intended. When you try to protect your partner or your adult children or your younger children from distress yourself by not talking about your emotions. It's very well intended, but it sometimes can impede communication. You just don't end up talking to people about your experience. Okay, relationships, however, what's found in, starting to be found in pancreatic cancer, but also certainly in other cancer problems, is the importance of relationships. So in a large scale review covered, um, published several years ago, emotional support was the kind of support most desired by people living with cancer. And it was also had the strongest relationship with later psychological adjustment. So emotional support seems particularly important. This next quote is from someone living with pancreatic cancer. The importance of caregivers and families. Informational support also can be really helpful if it's from a credible source, like Dr. Donahue, like somebody who really knows what they're talking about because pancreatic cancer is different than other cancers. And even some of you in this room have had very different experiences with pancreatic cancer. So finding credible sources obviously is very important. And then there's always the challenging challenge of accepting help. Many of us go through lives helping others and it's hard to accept help. But in the cancer experience, people often find that being able to accept help from other people gives them some way, something that they can do. And it's really important for them that you allow them to support you. Okay, so coping. Uh, this is my major area of research, and so it's like having a toolkit. Um, we know that what, what works for one doesn't work for all that some coping strategies are more helpful than others. However, we do not have the research in pancreatic cancer yet, and that's what we're doing right now. Past coping strategies may be helpful or not. You may need to develop some new strategies. One thing we know <laughs> is that this ends up not being so good. Um, avoidance. So in other cancers, what we find is that Trying to push thoughts and feelings out of your head about your experience ends up, even prior to the cancer diagnosis, ends up predicting poor adjustment after the diagnosis. Also, avoidance at diagnosis predicts poor adjustment down the road, prior to and after surgery, and three years later. So really trying to push thoughts and feelings out of one's head doesn't seem to work very well, and in fact, bites you back. Um, in that people are more prone to depression and other kinds of problems. But focused distraction can be really helpful. 
Isn't it wonderful when you have some minutes or hours or days without thinking about cancer? Focusing on something meaningful in your life can be very important. What we found in many studies, not in pancreatic cancer, but in others, seeking information and resources, very important. Identifying the needs of different family members, actively accepting that this is something that you're living with. Finding time to identify, acknowledge, and express emotions, accepting support, communicating with your healthcare team, using the spiritual resources you have. In many studies now, although not in people with pancreatic cancer yet, we find that these more approach-oriented strategies are more helpful in reducing depression, improving quality of life, improving um, mood, and improving physical symptoms. There are many supportive resources that you can take advantage of. The Hirschberg Foundation, obviously. The Sims Mann Center, UCLA Center for Integrative Oncology. Actually, if you want to talk about this center, it's a free center at UCLA. And one of my, um, I had the honor of having a PhD student who now is a psychologist who attends the lunch meeting and not just for lunch. Elizabeth Cleary is here. Uh, if you'd like to talk to her, she has many, many resources. There are also mindfulness classes that are available, the Center for East West Medicine, et cetera. So there are many resources, and I'd be happy, we'd be happy to connect you with them. And Lizzie also, I'm sorry, Dr. Cleary also is, uh, is very happy to talk with you. Okay, research is very lacking. What you'll see in your bags is a uh, brochure about our research, the research that the Hersberg Foundation is, um, is supporting on understanding the experience and how best to cope. It's three sessions, one in-person session and two over the phone or on paper. Um, and then Drs. Doring and Lee have another study upcoming, I believe we'll start inviting people in about three months, and that actually Dr. Doring, do you want to say one thing about it? We want to let you know that um, the Hirschberg Foundation has funded this study, and we're going to be following up from Dr. Stanton's study and inviting some of you who have participated in that study to join ours, where we'll be doing an intervention to help patients and caregivers um, in their cancer trajectory. Thank you. OK, so that'll be coming up. Look in a few months. So finally, what we know we know that most people do well, and that relationships and coping are very important in helping one do well. Resources are available, and they're only going to get more plentiful as we develop evidence-based approaches to support people. We have a lot yet to learn. And a main takeaway is one size doesn't fit all. There is no one right way to cope. There is no one right way to deal with it. But research can help us know what works for what person. And we think that that's very important. So I want to thank the many, many, many people, that, and now thousands of people who are, have participated in our studies. And I welcome you to participate in this study we have going now. The Hirschberg Foundation, obviously UCLA, and this incredible family that Aggie has, has amassed here. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stanton. R wonderful talk. Uh, some questions from the audience. Joe, this is Steve. <clears throat> Excellent talk. Um, although I'm more of a biochemist and population scientist, I want to say I want to say what you're doing is extremely important. So the the question is: Are are you uh, in your study measuring outcomes like like complications of surgery or chemotherapy and things like that? And and I guess the ultimate question is: Do you think that you can have an effect on survival? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, we are measuring some outcomes. We're, of course, measuring physical symptoms. We're also, we also will be measuring um, days hospitalized and some very important healthcare type outcomes. This study obviously is very, very much too small to think about survival. But I will tell you that we have conducted in breast cancer patients here at UCLA in conjunction with the Mindful Awareness Research Center. We have conducted a study with young breast cancer patients 
and it was a randomized control trial to teach them mindful awareness, so active acceptance of their experience, present moment focus. What we found there was that the, that the intervention decreased depression, increased positive mood, decreased fatigue, and had important impact on other outcomes. It also uh, decreased pro-inflammatory gene expression and inflammatory signaling. Might that be a pathway in terms of survival? Maybe. Um, there are studies that suggest that psychological intervention, randomized controlled trials, may be able to improve survival. I think the more important thing is that they improve the way you live as you live. And I would say there is no, um, meta-analyses would say there is no definitive evidence that psychological interventions improve survival. But we know that they do improve adherence to medical regimens, they improve depression, they improve adherence to, to prescriptions, and so those are really important pathways on that pathway to survival. Okay, um, my question was, uh, how, are we, how are you going to start bringing more awareness to those who suffer for, from depression and anxiety? Like, what are we going to do? Because not a lot of people think about the emotional part of having pancreatic cancer. That's true. Not a lot of people think about it, and that's why I wanted to, to mention it, because it is a really important experience of some people. Um, we, what we always do with our findings is when we get our findings, we both publish it in the scientific literature, and we find forums like these to communicate with people who participated in our research. We also try to do publication in the lay public to disseminate the kind of research we do. And then most importantly, the findings from this study, we are going to, we hope, translate that into effective interventions to help people deal with depression and anxiety specifically. I'm more interested in the caregivers because they, I find out that the caregivers has to be paid attention to. They have to have respite. They have to have vacation. They can, because then we have to decrease the guilt. Because I found out that even my mother, if I don't do this, I feel guilty. So, but, but sometimes it, we have to help the caregivers not to feel guilty because it's really hard day in, day out. You know, so I think the caregivers is very important that they have to have respite care, they have to have support. You just said this much, much better than I can. Um, this is called in the literature caregiver burden, and many caregivers feel guilty when they're not doing 24 seven with the, the person affected. They feel guilty if they go out and have a massage um, and so having respite and self-care in other cancers, and I can't imagine that it doesn't apply here, we know is very important. We also know that there are effective interventions to help caregivers with self-care. And so, and so uh, the, the, caregiving, um, the caregiving dynamic is extremely important. That's why we're including caregivers in our study. That's why Dr. Doring and Lee are including caregivers in their study. It's extremely important. Alzheimer, because not only that you, you don't have the regular re relationship, you lose that relationship. Yes. And so you get lonely because they, they miss us, you see. And, and then when you, get, you feel guilty, and there was one piece of news that I, years ago I read that one daughter just gets so, so overwhelmed. She left her mother in the, park, in, the, in the mall. And everybody says, how can you do that? But not until people know how is it to go through that? It's very hard, you know, including like Alzheimer's because people don't even recognize you as a person. Thank you. Lupe. Caregiving literature actually is Alzheimer's. Yes. And, and so there is attention being paid in the literature. Yes. 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 Yes.
evidence-based interventions out there that serve to effectively help not only psychological health, but physical health of caregivers as well? Well, I feel that guilt is a poison, and so communication between family members is extremely important. And I also feel that you cannot give what you don't have. If you're really tired, you cannot care for a loved one, whether you're a survivor or a caregiver. If you're not spiritually healthy, you can't be there for them spiritually, mentally. So I think you have to be selfish sometimes and take care of yourself, make yourself strong so that you're there for the other person, whether you're a caregiver or a survivor. I probably would call that self-interested. It's not taking away from the other person. It's giving some care to self, 